Mesdames et messieurs, bienvenue. Delegates, friends, thank you very much indeed for joining us for this next session. It says here, a next era for women's cancer control. We can rephrase that, a new era. We're promised a new era for women's cancer control. So that's the theme of this next session, this panel session, which I'm delighted to announce that I will be moderating. My name is Henry Bonsu, a British Ghanaian television and radio broadcaster based in London, and I've worked on several occasions with the WHO moderating sessions. I've got a personal and professional interest in this, and I talk about cancer care, inequality, equity, etc., regularly on my television and radio shows. So in a few minutes, I'll introduce our expert panel who sit on the seats behind me, and we'll discuss a range of things, including how health systems are failing women, how inequities in access to cancer care can be reduced through UHC, universal health care or coverage, how digital solutions can advance holistic cancer care, and the role of meaningful partnerships. So that will start very shortly. But first, in order to frame this discussion and give it some historical context, I have the honor of calling upon the World Health Organization's distinguished Director General, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, to provide a special announcement. Your Excellency, please come up on stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, moderators. Thank you, Henry, my friend. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And it's such an honor uh, to be here with you. 71 years ago, a grave injustice occurred when a black American woman with terminal cervical cancer went to hospital and had a biopsy taken without her permission. Her name was Henrietta Lacks and her life mattered. The cells taken from Henrietta became the basis of groundbreaking research and technologies that are now used to prevent and treat the same cervical cancer that took Henrietta's life. Many people have benefited from those cells. Fortunes have been made. Science has advanced. Nobel prizes have been won. And most importantly, many lives have been saved. In 2018, as you may remember, I issued a call for coordinated action globally to eliminate cervical cancer. Since then, notable progress has been made in many countries, yet more is needed. Much like the injustice of Henrietta Lacks story, disadvantaged women all over the world continue to face disproportionately higher incidence and mortality from cervical cancer. If we are to realize our dream of eliminating this disease, the innovations created with Henrietta Lacks cells must be available to all women. Today, I have the privilege of appointing four members of her family, Lacks family, as WHO Goodwill Ambassadors to advocate for cervical cancer elimination. Lawrence, Alfred, Victoria, and Veronica. Thank you for joining us in this fight. And we believe you tr truly represent this cause and look forward to working with you very closely. And it's an honor to welcome you to the WHO family and we look forward to working with you to make a cervical cancer history. And before I close, I would also like to thank my colleague, Dr. Nono Simelela for her leadership. I don't know where she's hiding. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And then re back, back to you. Dr. Thank Tedros, you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Please stay there. I would like to invite the Lax family to come up on stage. Please, they're the new WHO 
Goodwill Ambassadors, thank you very much indeed. Let's do the photograph and then we'll hear from Mr. Alfred Lax Carter Jr. who will say a few words. Okay, let's hear from Alfred. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. I am humble standing here today on behalf of my uncle Lawrence, who's the eldest of Henrietta's only living child and his granddaughters, Victoria and Veronica. We thank the World Health Organization for the distinct honor of appointing us as goodwill ambassadors for cervical cancer elimination. In accepting this commitment, we do so in recognition of my grandmother, Henrietta Lacks. This month, we commemorate 71 years since her untimely death on October 4th, 1951. And her cells changed the world as she unknowingly became the mother of modern medicine. We ask that you join us, standing in solidarity with patients, survivors, and families all around the world to ensure that no other wife, mother, sister dies from this needless cancer. We ask that you join us. From our home in Baltimore, Maryland, to communities around the world, we are committed to taking action to end cervical cancer disparities. As ambassadors, we will partner with the WHO, patients, providers, and policymakers to address the need where the burden is greatest, advocating to ensure equitable access to breakthroughs that Henrietta cells made possible, such as HPV vaccine and cervical cancer treatment. As we advance Henrietta's legacy, indeed, in this next era, of women's cancer control, we must remember nothing for us without us. We call upon you, global leaders, policymakers, patient advocates, clinicians, and civil society organization to provide equal access to cervical cancer, education screening, vaccination, and treatment for people all around the world. Again, thank you to our friends in the fight, our fellow patient advocates, around the world, and Dr. Tedros, Dr. Nono, Dr. Parham, and WHO. We stand ready to serve. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Alfred Lax Carter Jr. on behalf of the Lax family. And could we now have a photograph with Dr. Tedros, please? Let me get out of the way. And photographers, you can arrange the Secretary General and uh, the Director General and everybody together. The Lax family. The new Goodwill Ambassadors, the Lax family. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Tedros. Now you can see a range of names up here on the stage and some seats that are empty. We need to fill those seats with people of quality and expertise. And I'm delighted to say we have them sitting there to my right, stage right. So let me invite them up. First of all, Dr. Princess Nono Similela, Assistant DG for Strategic Programmatic Priorities Cervical Cancer Elimination. Please come up on stage. We have Dr. Susan Henshaw, outgoing CEO, City Cancer Challenge Foundation. We have Dr. Miriam Mutebi, the Union for International Cancer Control. We have Theresa Graham, Head of Product Strategy at Roche. And Dr. Jeremy Lim, Associate Professor so Sui Hock School of Public Health, National University of Singapore. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sure you can agree that's a panel of, and I'm a fan of the English Premier League, not the Bundesliga, Premier League quality, Premier League quality. <laughs> so just to give you some a sense, so Dr. Uh, no, no, she's from South Africa. 
She's been appointed Assistant Director General for Family, Women, Children and Adolescents at the WHO. More than 30 years of experience as an obstetrician, academic, advocate and government official. Let me tell you about Dr. Henschel, the outgoing Chief Executive of City Cancer Challenge. She's overseen the strategic uh, development and implementation of CCAN and most recently the transition to a standalone Swiss foundation is now operating in seven cities in all regions. And the expertise continues. Dr. Miriam Mutebi is a breast surgical oncologist and assistant professor in the Department of Surgery at the Aga Khan University Hospital in Nairobi, Kenya. Teresa Graham, so head of global product strategy for Roche, um, she's been in this role since May 2019. She's passionate about working in partnerships and developing solutions to accelerate innovation and access. And Dr. Lin as well, the co-founder and CEO of Amilai, the first dedicated, this sounds interesting, gut microbiome, <laughs> full service. That, that sounds very interesting, your gut and the microbiome that's living in there, full service company in Southeast Asia. This is great expertise. One more time, give me the round of applause. Thank you very much. So here's what's going to happen. For the next 50 or so minutes, we're going to have a discussion, but it's not just between ourselves. People are watching online and you're tuning in here in this room. And then when we've kicked around the key issues, then we want you to get involved and ask questions, brief statement perhaps, but engage. It's a circular, people talk about circular sustainable economies. It's a circular, sustainable energy that's going to last for another hour and a quarter. Are you ready? You see, I want energy. I want connection. I want feeling. Are you ready to debate and engage? That's what I want to hear. Wonderful. Okay. Sue, I'm going to start off with you. Okay. Okay. I'm not nervous at all after that, but keep Well, you need to be. You need to be because the bar is high. But I know, Sue Henschel, you can meet it, can't you? Yes, she can. Look, I say this a lot, and this is the elephant in the room. This the barriers women face, even in so-called highly developed, highly industrialized countries, the barriers they face in their patient journey. Can you focus on some of those challenges? Tell us what they are. At what point these road up roadblocks begin? Do they begin in primary care? Do they begin in triage or further down the line? Um, or even earlier, please. So first of all, I would say that if you look at a patient journey, a woman experiences barriers across that journey from the earliest stages. At City Cancer Challenge, we focus very much on the diagnostic and the treatment part of that journey. And I learned a term this week, and I, hopefully it's not going to be considered jargon, but I thought it aptly explained the diagnostic odyssey is not a journey. It's long, complicated, and unpredictable. So if you think about those three things, how is it that in 2022 that every woman isn't able to have a short, timely, uncomplicated diagnostic journey? You framed it very interestingly. In fact, you've gone back to the ancient classics, the Odyssey, Homer. Is it that bad? It's that bad. And I, I want to say that it's not, it's not just one patient. It's not just one woman. It's women we speak to in every city that have their care not only fragmented. So in some cases, women will get treated in four or five different institutions. But not only that, the clinicians and the nurses and all of the allied professionals that are trying to support that woman, they don't have access to their clinical notes. They don't know what came before. So when that woman moves from one center to another, she is starting again. And if you can imagine that happens every time, that's when we have an odyssey. That's right. So no continuity of care, despite attempts by governments all over the world to make sure that there is a focal person who knows everything about you and can be the node through which everything is transmitted. Um, Miriam, can you tell us then, because we've talked about the clinical barriers, about the cultural barriers that women face on their odyssey, their road to diagnosis and treatment, and, and how the impact of cancer is felt 
beyond the individual women, the impact on families, of course, communities and society more generally. All right. Um, thank you, Henry. And I think uh, really just reflecting on um, Sue's description of the Odyssey, I think there's lots of valuable learning points from Homer that we could perhaps apply uh, throughout the course of this conversation, but really drilling down to the cultural barriers and sort of looking at a bigger picture, we see the three main barriers that Sue has um, eloquently tried to highlight. The first being the financial barriers that women are having to pay um, um, Patients in many, in many parts of, of, uh, of the world are having to pay out of pocket in order for them to access care, further uh, compounded by the, um, by the um, health system barriers that Sue has outlined. When we look at the um, cultural barriers, we realize there's a lot of heterogeneity. But I think one of the major factors is the fact that women are not the primary determinants of their health-seeking behavior and as such require either financial support or sometimes indeed in some cases permission in order for them to access care, all of which translate into delays in diagnosis. Um, one of the other cultural barriers that we see um, in many parts of the world is the stigma that exists around a diagnosis of cancer. Even just recently, I had a patient come in on Friday and met her relative in the corridor and actually disappeared. And the nurse told me she had, you know, um, retreated because she didn't want her relative, one of her relatives to go home and, you know, amplify those messages. And so we're still seeing a lot of stigma and discrimination around patients who have a diagnosis. And this is not just from the community. We're also seeing the legal implications. Patients are uh, getting disenfranchised, uh, losing their jobs. So all of those um, aspects um, translate into delays and reluctance to actually um, access care. Again, in, South, in uh, Africa, we say our biggest strength is our community. Yes. But it can be a double-edged sword, especially when women um, don't have agency over their decision-making. So, for instance, what we see is, as a breast cancer surgeon, I will come in um, and discuss with the patient and say, your uh, surgical options would be perhaps to either conserve the breast or to do a mastectomy. And so she goes off for a bit, and then we have the clan coming in. And the senior elder says, we have decided um, she will have a mastectomy. Wow. And so we're saying... Who's we? But yeah. until we do you challenge that? So if you've got exactly. some some elder elder who's the keeper of, of the community's <laughs> wisdom, and then you are medically trained, yeah. how do you push back against that? Yeah. Henry, it, it's it's a really more nuanced discussion because until we empower our women, and it's not just a question of decision making, it's giving them the financial backing in order to um really translate those um, decisions into action because what happens is you say, okay, you push back and say, listen, who are you to decide? But yeah. then at the end of the day, the lady says they're the ones paying. So, you know, oh. so it really, really is a push to us to do better across multi-sectoral lines. Okay. Thank you very much, Miriam. So we've talked, we've gone back to Homer. We've talked about the clinical odyssey, the cultural odyssey. And let's move on to Nono and, and how we try and challenge this through initiatives like, for example, the WHO's global strategy to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer, as well as the WHO's global breast cancer initiative. Um, how will these global programs translate down to the local situation, dealing with elders and communities and with historical and traditional beliefs, and ultimately result in improved cancer care for women at the grassroots around the world. It's a big task. Wow, thank you. Thank you for that question. I think uh, I'm, I'm happy you actually took the whole conversation to the grassroots. Yes. And what I only differ with is this whole no notion that it's a big task. Ah. It isn't. It's a big task because we've made it so. Mm. Communities have always been there. People in, in developing countries, indigenous com communities, indigenous communities everywhere, communities have always been there. We've took the way people live, we made that a problem, and then we are surprised that there is disjunction. If we had made it our duty to be in that community, to talk to the elders, you wouldn't have the situation that my colleague has explained. And, and I, I want to, to refer to Prof. Paham, yes. topmost gynecologist, oncologist. He speaks to traditional healers. Identify the gatekeepers in the community. 
treat them with respect, talk to them. And then the whole dialogue changes. So instead of push back, I should have said engage. No, no. Oh. The, a word came up. They do not have the money. That is where the pressure point is. Cervical cancer is a cancer of neglect. It's a cancer where leadership, political <clears throat> uh, constituencies, we as a global community decided we don't actually care about this. It's not worth investing in people who are going to die anyway. I just want, I want, to under, I want us to understand that. Mm -hmm. So the lack of access that uh, my colleague refers to is because people do not have jobs. The economy doesn't count them. They don't get educated. And the tragedy is that this is an intergenerational thing. Those women that have died in the couple of minutes we've having a conversation, they've left their children now. Same is going to happen to them. And then we will keep coming to ask, what is the answer? The bottom up. Let us do the bottom up for real, not, not in, in, in just words. Okay. So these initiatives are what I must, I must pay. No, pay, please. Pay. I'll allow you to land, as we say in Accra. Yeah. You can land. Land. Let me land because you asked me a specific question that neither of my panelists will answer. The initiatives, look at what they've done. The Cervical Can Cancer Initiative has corrected an injustice. It's a big, big deal for us. The Breast Cancer Initiative, the, the Children's Initiative, Cancer Initiative, that we, it's doing the same. It's just that we can't bring everybody here to Berlin for, for people to see that it is by being in the communities, listening, listening, and not, not using our language, to describe other people's issues, putting new titles to old problems, and then saying, oh, this is a problem. It is, it isn't. For my grand, great, great dad to decide my name should start with this, it's okay. Yes. And we embrace that. So I just think the, for me, the message is deconstruct what's happening here, decolonize it, yeah. what is happening here. And Look at, is there capacity at the grassroots? And I bet you there is. Okay. If people can be able to eat in the middle of a pandemic or a storm or poverty, and a woman can get 10 children to eat one apple and have no peace herself, yes, there is, there is hope, there is optimism. Us here need to turn our arguments upside down and be happy. To have a meeting like this one day in an African continent. Come okay, back. thank you very much. No, no, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so circling back, we've uh, done the clinical odyssey, the cultural odyssey with the decolonization and inverting the pyramid. Uh, let me circle back to Sue. Policy change. What will be necessary policy wise? at the local and national levels to transform health systems, as Nona was indicating, so they can, they can deliver on these goals we've all agreed upon. Can you give us some examples about the type of policy change that can improve women's access to good quality healthcare in low resource settings? So I want to circle back to okay. the comment by Nona, which is, Perhaps it's not the policy itself, it's how the policy is generated. Yeah. So if I talk specifically, um, and I, I think Mr. Lack said it very eloquently, nothing about us without us. Yeah. If a policy on clinical guidelines for cervical or breast cancer is generated with the right people at the table, at the community level, at the ground, that it is not unfeeling or unresponsive to the local needs, then that policy will, by definition, not just be adopted by the national government if it's presented in the right way with the right processes, but it will be implemented. And it will be implemented by the people that actually came up with the process in the first place. So you asked the specific question, which policies? 
Well, the health community, in fact, has been very narrow, even in what policies they should be looking at. So as City Cancer Challenge, we've been really asking the question of our cities, we're not going to give you the 10 policies that you should invest in. Mm -hmm. We want you to work with us and do a landscape of layering what policies you do have and what are the policies that are either missing or need to be strengthened, which you can see are blocking this patient journey? Right. Now, I, well, you know what I want to know from you, Susan? Yes. I need from the seven cities where you've been working with intensively around the world, an example, an example. of how this is working. So I, I'm, I mean, I'm going to give you an example and you're going to say, how does that matter? I may not. Well, you might not, but for, for, for any, you know, non-medical, non-specialist out there, pathology might not be something that you talk about in your daily lives. But if you don't have quality pathology, you don't have a quality diagnosis, and you don't have a treatment journey that is about you, about your cancer. So a very specific example is in Porto Alegre in Brazil where it came through the, the needs assessment process that there was no quality pathology guidelines in any of the laboratories that were um, taking cancer samples from institutions. Mm -hmm. So the city came together and they developed the guidelines and they built it into a policy that's been adopted at the municipal level. So every laboratory must follow quality guidelines around pathology for cancer. And what kind of impact do you think this has had? Well, I can- It's all about impact, yes. <laughs> I can't tell you, I can't honestly stand up here today saying that a policy that was implemented in the last six months okay. is having is having impact today. But what I know from, from research from other environments is that those samples from those women will be treated in a way where they have the best likelihood of getting the right diagnosis. Thank you very much, Susan. Sorry to press you so, so right. urgently, but I needed the answer and yeah. you delivered. You've landed. Thank right. you. I'm going to go to you, Teresa, from the private sector. You know, we've um, talked either tangentially or directly about, you know, breast, ovarian and cervical cancers. Um, but how do these strategies we've discussed uh, relating to those uh, very well-known cancers, um, how do they also apply to reaching women um, who are living with other cancers, other diseases like lung cancer, liver cancer, or others to meet that holistic need, treating the whole woman. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you asked this question because I think oftentimes when we talked about when we talk about women's health, we think about the sum of her reproductive parts. We're, we're more than our breasts and our ovaries and our cervix, right? And, and unfortunately, um, for most cancers, all cancers, we really don't have. Um, sex-specific research that happens. And we do know through basic biology that there are differences in almost every tissue system in a woman's body from a man's body. But for far too long, men have been the default human. Um, basic research conducted in labs until very recently was only ever conducted on male mice um, because the, the hormones were too difficult to control for. Um, and so I think we really need to take a giant step back. And you, you asked, you know, where does the disparity start? I mean, the disparity starts in the lab. It starts in the lab because we can't keep girls in STEM. It, it starts in the lab because we're not always asking questions about how could a cancer show up differently for a woman than a man or for a person who's not Caucasian. Um, you know, I'm amazed that's still the situation. It's it, and, and it's sad. It's sad that we're this, you know, we're this far along, but there's a reason why the FDA just issued, issued the guidelines that it issued on, on inclusive research, because we're just not there yet. Um, but I think it is incumbent, um, particularly on industry, to really think differently about how we are doing our research, how we're, um, how, you know, the role that we play in making sure that we're actually asking these questions and we're asking them very early in the process and in ways that can actually help us shape the way research is done. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking then about how um, the focus on the likes of breast, ovarian and cervical cancers and the research applied to it, um, how we pivot from that to the other cancers I mentioned. So lung cancer, liver cancer, et cetera. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think it's it, it's not so much a question of a pivot if it's just a question of people have to start taking a sex-based lens. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it's more about just doing post hoc analyses on, you know, male versus female. It's about asking fundamental questions about biology at the beginning of the work that you're doing when you're working on, on cancers that aren't just at the breast and the cervix and the ovaries. Okay, so odysseys, clinical odysseys, uh, culture, decolonization, inverting pyramids, um, dealing with STEM in the lab. Let's move now to innovation. Well, it's all innovation, but innovation, Singapore style. Jeremy, <laughs> it's time for you to come in. Let's talk about capacity building and knowledge sharing. What role do they play in helping countries all over the world uh, make progress towards global goals? How many years until the SDGs mature? Eight years, these global goals, uh, and also national and local implementation. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad, Henry, that I'm not the only thorn among the roses. Right? <laughs> you describe yourself as a thorn. You know, we're not the default human. The female is, uh, yes. is a default human. Absolutely. But it's true, isn't it? <laughs> right. And on your question around capacity building and your reference to Singapore style, and, and I think, really, Henry, let me introduce one more buzzword, the medical mafia. Right. Right. And one of the challenges is that a lot of capacity, a lot of capacity building, while while well intentioned, is not context specific. Like for example, I had done surgical training in Singapore in the UK. I then, as a former British colony, all of us in well Singapore back then went to the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh, Glasgow, and nobody ever asked me across part one, two, and so on. What sort of diseases do you see in your country? Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, just look around all of us. If this conference were not in Berlin, but in Singapore, where temperatures can be 31, 32 degrees Celsius, we'll, we'll still be wearing ridiculous suits. Right. There'll be no cultural wear. Yes. Right. So it's so admirable that the developed world cares enough to undertake capacity building. But let's take it even further. Let's make it context specific. Let's cut the coat according to the cloth, which we have to do. There is no, there's really no point teaching someone how to do a prostatectomy using a robot if there's one robot to serve a hundred million population. So we as the so-called developed world have to be much more thoughtful, much more intentional about capacity building and how we're bringing the right type of innovation, the right type of mindsets. Otherwise, it's really such a shame, all the good intentions, all the energy not optimized. So what would that look like then? Let's say you have this robot in Singapore and you're dealing with, let's have a look, um, Paraguay, okay, Paraguay. Yes, I'm looking at you, Susan, for that reason, because of the city kinds of challenge. Okay, and you're down there and you think, well, it's ridiculous trying to bring this one robot to this one institution in Paraguay, or Paraguay, is how you're supposed to say it, when it's not practical. So what would your innovation be? What would you do if you went down there and said, look, you know, I've got to think differently? Well, Number one, you may want to ask whether Singapore is the right place to undertake training, yeah. right? Uh, and I know it's it's really very sexy, it's very prestigious to say you trained in Hopkins, in Stanford. But if we take a step back, many of these places may not be the right places for the sort of training that individuals need to bring back the greatest contributions to their, to their respective countries. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, and here the well, medical mafia is... is it is to blame as our funders, right? We want to create programs in countries that we're much more familiar with that are basically pedigreed or brand name institutions. And I think just as what Theresa said, change is happening, but I think it's happening a bit too slowly. And we really have to have that call to action to move faster and really build these, not just north-south networks, but south-south networks when it comes to capacity building. Okay, thank you. Very I know you're desperate to come in. Do you have something you do? Okay, because we've now moved from Homer and the Odyssey of clinical um, journeys and um, cultural journeys and inverting pyramids and decolonizing to medical mafia. This is quite a conversation. <laughs> but we're going to go to you, Miriam. You're working in Kenya, yes, at the moment? Right. So we've talked uh, primarily about women as uh, patients, the whole woman, not just the collection of, of, of reproductive organs uh, and in improving access to uh, cancer care, wherever you are in whichever country and wherever you are on that clinical and cultural journey. 
But uh, women play an outsized role. I think I said this in my preamble, an outsized role as caregivers in the home and as healthcare professionals. So how can championing education, which we've mentioned, and, and empowering women through training, especially in surgery, uh, make lasting changes in cancer care for women's health if they've been trained a particular way, often by male leaders in their institutions? Um, I don't know if that was your situation. Um, thanks, 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 Henry. And I think it's really thinking about the workforce collectively and really at trying to ex expand inclusivity in the workforce. So it's not just men versus women. It's looking at how do we uh, integrate all these different aspects. What we do realize is that um, women play an integral role in the healthcare system. Um, and but what we do see is, especially if we look at the pyramid, so to speak, we notice that um, the lower tiers, 70% um, of the workforce is mainly female. But when you sort of ascend to the um, leadership positions, then we realize that that becomes less and less. Um, we do know for surgery specifically that nine out of 10 um, people globally don't have access to safe, timely surgery. And what we do know is that uh, women play a unique role in expanding this gap, especially in trying to um, mitigate some of the barriers, uh, social cultural barriers. Somebody comes in, they don't want to disclose that they have a breast or cervical cancer problem just because it's taboo, for instance, to talk to somebody your son's age. So it's really looking at how do we expand that gap? I mean, how do we expand the workforce? And even as we talk about all these fancy ideas around um, you know, integrated uh, approaches to care, unless we're having an inclusive, diverse and expanded workforce, because we know, for instance, women only form less than 5% of the surgical workforce in sub-Saharan Africa. And we're asking ourselves, well, how do we, you know, increase it potentially by 50%? And that's really looking through how do we encourage an enrollment and the retention of women in surgery, but really looking at them, not just as a, you know, hands on deck, it's really looking at how do we give them the tools for transformative leadership? whether it's at a hospital level, whether it's at a county level, whether it's the policy level, what are the skill sets they need in order to provide respectful care um, for our patients and where they're able to speak um, to the patient's needs and the unique concerns is really about what the whole ethos is. So it's not just increasing women for the numbers sake, but it's really putting, um, giving them the strategic skill sets in order for us as a workforce uh, to provide the care that our patients are urgently mm -hmm. requiring. There's quite a number of questions there that you raise. Have you found an answer to them yet? <laughs> um, we're starting. Well, again, to the Homer reference, um, yes. really looking through, it, it did take him a while, probably about 10 years, but it did end. And so it's really a call to arms for all of us. We are you know, slowly starting to shift the needle, but I think more urgent action is required. And it doesn't, it's not just women, it's looking at all of us as a global community. Yeah. Um, the One of the learning points that we recognize from Homer is the importance of collaboration. And we are, you know, he was getting Achilles and everybody else to, you know, um, uh, fight the battles together. But it's really looking at those multi-sectoral approaches. It's not just health. It's how do we keep these ladies in school? Even before we talk about STEM, how do we, um, you know, ensure that they're going through their primary education? We know that um, the majority of um, health, um, in terms of um, literacy, um, we, we talk about awareness, but unless our patients both men and women are educated, yes. they're not going to be able to recognize the signs of um, uh, sign, common signs and symptoms of cancer. And what we realize is that two thirds of the uh, world's uh, literacy um, patient, um, communities that are not educated are uh, largely represented by women. So how do we then increase our retention? And we know that just increasing an extra year of primary education yeah. raises a woman's capacity to earn by 10 to 20%. So really, how do we get them through that entire process where they're not only aware of uh, they're able to increase their economic empowerment, but they're also able um, to take charge of their own health agency and seeking behavior. So it's a financial discussion. It's an education discussion. It's really multi-sectoral. It's, it's really global, isn't it? It's not just about STEM. You know, yeah, yeah there's so much more. Thank you very much for that, um, Miriam. Uh, Jeremy, now, much of your work focuses on technology and the ways in which it can increase health equity and access to care. We need to discuss this a bit further. Uh, let's talk about it and the ways in which it can um, accelerate progress, uh, both in Singapore and in Paraguay, uh, towards these goals. Um, so 
we're talking about a new era of oh, the, the sign's gone. We're talking about a new era. <laughs> I was looking over there. Um, you can see how you used to work in TV uh, of um, women's cancer control, as though it's something we can control increasingly. Um, what role will technology play increasingly in this endeavor, in this goal that we have? I'm no naive techno optimist. I'm fully mindful of the of the thyroid cancer debacle in Korea. But at the same time, I'm also mindful that cancer diagnosis are shooting through the roof. Yeah. It is a fool's errand to try to train enough healthcare professionals as the only intervention. We have to leverage technology in much smarter ways. And I just checked earlier, earlier today, as of today, there are over 500 US FDA approved technologies in various forms around radiology and really so on. So, so it's not that that technology, the use of AI machine learning hasn't come into the forefront. The, the challenge is how do we bring them in quickly enough, not just to serve the rich world, but to serve everybody. In an upstream fashion. Yes. Mm. And and as I think one of the one of the analogies that I reflect on is the development of consumer technology, right? And let's not have perfect be the enemy of good. I think many of us in this room are old enough to remember the early sp smartphones, mm -hmm. right? You needed a handbag to carry them, right? And they didn't do very much. But if there was no V1, there would not be a version 3 or a version 4. And I'm wondering whether we as the medical mafia, the experts, are putting an onerously high burden of, of proof for a lot of these technologies that really in a, in a resource-constrained setting, are we competing against best in class or are we competing against nothing? And maybe some of the questions we should think about is, is it better to have a test that is 70, 75% good enough that is accessible to virtually the entire population? Or do we want a 95% hmm. sensitivity, specificity, but only available in major cities? I sense a frustration here. Is that because you have in your mind's eye um, a piece of kit, technology, innovation that you think could have been rolled out, but it didn't meet a certain standard? As a result, it was moribund. Do you have one in mind? Well, I see Professor Ruby Huang here, uh, and we were just chatting around use of use of ultrasound to diagnose to as a screening tool for breast cancer yes right and there are fda approved modalities that are in various stages down the regulatory pathway and i'm wondering why we don't bring this into low it into lower resource countries and something that and if you don't mind me ruby i'll just say um, she had shared that in her home country, they had evaluated this about 10 years ago and it wasn't very good. And that may have been totally true 10 years ago, right? But, this, but the pace of, of particularly software innovation is immense. And I'm not sure whether we, we trap ourselves in this straight jacket by saying that we have reviewed this two years ago, we won't look at it for the next five years because that's, that's, a, that's a traditional medical mindset. And the Problems are so pressing, they're so urgent. Can we move faster? And I would say the answer is yes, we not only can, but we must. What will it what would it take to eliminate that blockage? Well, I think we need to okay. Number one, we should not move fast and break things. That's a terrible thing to do in the world of healthcare. Yes. But at the same time, we cannot wait 17 years for for a discovery to become mainstream. And between these two extremes, we must find what is common ground. And often, and I and I used to do a lot of what is called HTA, health technology uh, uh, really assessments. And you're always asking yourself, what are you comparing against? Yeah. And far too often we compare any innovation against a so-called gold standard without uh, without recognizing that this gold standard exists only in a couple of very select centers around yeah. the world. Very good. I mean, all of uh, your fellow panelists are, are nodding their heads, perhaps most vigorously, Sue. So to you next. Um, so how do we ensure these uh, new technologies are deployed equitably mm -hmm. so that all women benefit and as soon as possible? Okay, so I'm going to just tell you one quick thing that happened at the beginning of the pandemic in one of our cities where um, in, in, in 
I'm going back to Brazil again, but Brazil, there was no law for telemedicine. There was no way for clinicians to offer telemedicine. And this had been in the Senate for many years. The, it was pushed through the parliamentary process and approved very quickly. And Porto Alegre wanted to roll out telemedicine because they had seen a massive drop off in women coming to clinic. And the phone call that I got was, can you, can you buy 200 cell phones for me? Not a single clinician had access to the infrastructure, basic infrastructure to, to deliver telemedicine. To actually do a Zoom call. To do it, to track a patient, they had nothing. Yeah. And so while that was a very well-meaning, you know, offer from a, from, a, from a local partner, it was not feasible. So to, to Jeremy's point, how do we do it? We need to ask, who are we building these solutions for? Because if the solutions are not built for the populations that they're there to serve, it doesn't matter how technologically incredible they are, it doesn't matter what the AI algorithm looks like, it's not going to work. And I'm going to go straight to AI because it's one of my, you know, it's one of my pain points as a, as a former cancer researcher, is a lot of the AI algorithms out there have been developed on um, samples and patient tissue samples in particular from high income countries. If you look at the data that's gone into these AI algorithms, they are very unrepresentative of the population as a whole. And I expect they're also very gender biased. Mm -hmm. um, so if we have that bias from the beginning, how can we say confidently that we can actually deploy an AI solution in Latin America, in Asia, when the data is not about Latin American people or Asian people. Yeah. Jeremy, you were itching to say something? So I agree with you totally, but it's a fixable problem, right? Today, there is no legal requirement. There's no economic rationale to, to embrace diverse data sets. But if there's enough political will, there's enough economic pressure, the whole logic of the private sector is to make products and services that people will pay for. Yes. So this is a fixable problem. I don't see AI as inappropriate or not useful enough. It's it's really us who haven't deployed them with the right mindsets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, Theresa, as a private sector representative on the panel, I mean, how can other sectors like, like the pharma industry mobilize and you know, be sensitive to what we've discussed in this room, help achieve these goals, improve women's cancer care? What role can different sectors play, but particularly yours? Yeah. So I, I think there's the, the role that you sort of count on us to play, which is to develop innovative medicines and diagnostics, right? I mean, for most of us sitting in this room, breast cancer went from a death sentence in our lifetime to something that can be relatively easily detected, that can be treated, you know, very effectively, particularly as you, as you think about screening techniques getting better and better. Um, and we continue to make strides in, in early diagnosis and better and better treatments. But I think a lot of things that have been said on this panel, I, I really deeply agree with, which is that, that, that that's great for the people who can actually get to those medicines. And the reality is lots of times, the reason why people particularly in low-income countries can't get there is because the systems just aren't in place for diagnosis at any stage, let alone early, which is why you tend to catch them in the metastatic center. So I think, you know, one of the most important things that, that, companies like mine can do is actually partner at the local level with people delivering the care to figure out what a system actually needs in order to be able to provide care to those patients. And I think a great example of this are the Empower Clinics. So these were clinics that were set up during COVID, by the way, there were zero before COVID and there are 16 now. Um, these are small clinics that exist um, primarily, I believe, in Kenya. Um, and basically in the corner of a hospital, in the corner of a community center of a place that already exists. They have people, community workers that they've trained to do breast and cervical cancer screening. They've now expanded that to do things like diabetes screening. Um, and I think over the course of the last couple of years, we've screened 16,000 people and, and, and caught 900, 800 cancers. Mm -hmm. um, and that's Sometimes it doesn't have to be the flashiest, most innovative solution. It has to be a solution that works for the patient in, in that community. Um, another, another advance, which, which I've just recently learned about, is actually a 
if right now it's for use in a clinic, but it's a vaginal swab that a woman can give to herself. So she takes her own vaginal swab and then she gives it to the healthcare worker and then the healthcare worker can, can run um, an HPV screening on it. In some cultures, that's a real barrier for women getting the HPV screening that they need. And so sometimes it's just about understanding the patient population that you want to reach and figuring out how to reach them where they're at with the tools that they need. Um, honestly, partnership was one of the best things to come out of COVID and you can feel it slipping away. And I just think that's the saddest thing. You can feel partnership slipping away. I, I really do. Hmm. I'm looking directly into your face, into your eyes. No, no, because you are partnership queen on this stage. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's true because, I mean, you know, we've been talking. I mean, partnership is one of those things, especially in, in the UN system. People talk about ad nauseum, you know, whether it's the UN Global Compact, UNDP, FAO, IFAD, all these big organizations, WHO. Um, but they're meant to be, they need to be meaningful. They're supposed to be not just a talking shop, but something that drives forward and mm -hmm. accelerates change. So none of I need to know from you how we can work more collaboratively so that the partnerships that were forced upon us by necessity in the last two or three years do not wither on the vine and disappear as people pivot back to normal. Mm -hmm. Okay, no thanks. No, I was getting a little bit... Uh, um, what, rested? No, I rest less <laughs> because, you know, the, the, the colleagues on the panel were raising issues that I actually, I wanted to add or counter what some no, of the I, I was watching you so, throughout that yeah. and I knew I was going to bundle them together and let them land on you. So they're now landing on you. And then when we're done... You have some time now. I can, I can escape. So you will not escape. There's going to be a QA. and a You will have to remain for that. Sorry, no, no. No, no, okay. No, you can't no. just throw uh, little grenades and leave. Uh, no, 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 I won't. No, okay. no. No, I just want... Uh, let me start first with the institution that I'm representing here at WHO. Yes. That, you know... Things are happening, you know. That is why I was just trying gently to urge um, the global health community to have these kinds of big meetings in Africa, yes. in developing, so that you can see, you know, when we say, oh, because the health systems are not there or the health systems don't, it, you, you need to know what you're talking about. You know, we were present, we were leading the fight in my country and I just saw my minister here and so I will gloat a little bit and we were told African people can't read the time therefore they can't take ARVs. The fights about health systems not being responsive. Let us just put a little nice thing around them and put them there and go back to what Jeremy said. Design things that are context specific. Don't design it something where you expect somebody who lives in a bush to wake up at 1 a.m. and go and check at lock. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. And then according to you, there's no system and it doesn't work. In some countries, a health system is too nurses going around giving people treatment. It works. So you, you, we've got to be very careful about how we dis describe how other people do things and have a, a standard. If it's not this, as Jeremy said, then it's nothing. I'm, I'm happy uh, to say I'm, I'm actually proud, uh, Jeremy, that Paraguay is leading WHO on the use of AI-driven plus new technology mm -hmm. for cervical cancer. There are companies here that have made what we call thermal ablation devices. Uh, for those who are not familiar with cervical cancer treatment, you just have something, it's just like my pen, and it's got a, a thing here that, you know, you can, it's like a scoop, mm -hmm. the kinds of things you use for ice cream, you know. You can have something like this, which has got heat at the end, and you scoop mm -hmm. the abnormal lesion out. Handheld, battery div driven. This is this is an innovator who was thinking about an in low income country, right? Yeah. So it's doable. You've got to do it context specific. Now we don't need these big gases, cryotherapy, whatever. It doesn't. When I come back to WHO, we pre qualify innovators who bring things quickly and they can work, there is a fast track system where the regulator, regulator can do this and the stuff is available in countries, low income countries can buy, can do whatever. There are people busy with market shaping. So the suggestion should not be that, oh, everything is stopped. It can't work, it's not working. I think that is not fair because there are a lot of hardworking healthcare providers 
hardworking politicians, hardworking experts in all of your institutions who are trying to make sure that these things work. But people need to work but and harmonize and partner. Exactly. Bigger. The only problem we have is we all stay in our little expert rooms and we don't come up. You know, I always call it a meerkats. You know, we you sit, you go into a little hole, you design your thing. Meerkats. Yes, I, this one. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, the one. Okay, that, okay. Yeah. It it does that. You you need to come out of your hole and look and check if somebody's not actually doing what you're doing, or you need to pivot, as you yes. say. You know, so things are doable in countries where people have nothing. Please believe me. People are living. They Indeed. are doing. You know, so there are leaders that are committed to doing the things that everybody here is saying, oh, please do it this way. Do it. Give the people the opportunity to do the things they need to do in the way they, let's make the choices easier, but at the same time, hold our own leadership accountable for when things don't happen. Yeah. Now, the whole story of the health health system, it's only women, it's only us. It's, it's going to take a long time to catch up you know, when I sit alone and I think, oh, my God, I don't want some of the people, young people in my family to come into the medical system because it's, it's, it seems like diseases are just coming out every day with the mm -hmm. pandemic. It's a hard thing to do, to be a doctor and nurse or whatever in the very systems we're describing. Innovation. Innovation. Yeah. You know, we've got to think about a different way of um, teaching undergrads for medical school. We can't have them in, in those desks and, and rooms for eight years or seven years, yeah. you know, when they, there's a, a revolution happening on technology. We must fast track. Somebody said, I think it was- There must be a way of doing You this. must fast track yeah. because as they grow, they are also surrounded by disease. It's not as if, you know, when I die, the, disease, the cervical cancer is going to go because now this was your issue. So we need to find different ways yeah. to get people to the and not look yeah. for the best. You know, don't design a Rolls Royce where there's no road, please. Yeah. Okay. You know, I'm okay in my bike. You know? And if <laughs> thank you very much. That, indeed. That's the thing. No, I like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you very much. Okay, so looking at the time, and that was a great uh, two rounds of questions. I have more, and I'm sure you have more answers. But I think now is the time where we want to hand over metaphorically, to you, colleagues. You must have questions, thoughts, responses to what you've heard, things that you want to uh, direct to particular speakers or more generally. So I'm going to look around the room and see, uh, look for the first person to put up their hand. Uh, and, uh, wow, well, one of them. Prof at the front, I'm going to go to you first of all. Can we have a microphone? Please remind us who you are and your, your, your question, a brief question, please. Hi, hi everyone. Ruby Huang. Uh, I have the privilege to be introduced by Jeremy. I'm from National Taiwan University. So the study he talked about was what Taiwan did uh, a couple of years ago. I thought about why that didn't carry on. It has a lot to do with the funding because it's a big government funded project. And then, you know, when even you want to resurrect that in a different setting, then the funding agency said, we've done this before, you have to come up with new evidence to tell us why in a different context that would still work. And I think that uh, brings a lot of pressure to the medical mafia, so to speak, for the innovation to kind of try to jump outside the box. I think we are not just technology, we have drug repurposing, we have off-label use. These are the innovations that physicians underground are trying to do. But when a, life, when a product is reaching the end of the life cycle, I don't think any commercial decision would be made to resurrect that in other indications. So that in a way, how do we finance that? Probably not through the normal funding agencies. We probably need to have a different financing uh, strategy to support the research because still you need the research to push that forward. So that is a response to Jeremy. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Jeremy. Any thoughts on that? New model. Yeah. Just two very quick reactions. One is that, yes, we do need separate funding streams where there's at least initially market failure. Right. 
and until you're at sufficient skill, it may not make sense. Someone needs to come in to fill this fill this funding gap. The, the second reaction, really, Ruby, is that I think funding will be insufficient. We also need a new regulatory way of looking at things. It's so common, whichever country that you go to, you bring something new. The first question, is it approved by EMA? Has the FDA given the green light? And remember, these are all jurisdictional already geographic agencies, right? The US F FDA will approve something for the US, something that's context specific to the US. It has no interest in what's happening in Singapore or anywhere else. So what's appropriate for a regulatory decision for the US may not be appropriate for other countries, but there is no plan B. And perhaps that's something we need to look at because most countries don't have that regulatory capacity and as Ruby very rightly pointed out, uh, no one wants to be the tall poppy. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Now there are more questions, lady right there, and then we'll spread it around the room. So, no, no, no the microphone's coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Salama Masume. I'm the head and professor of global surgery at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And I just wanted to support what uh, Dr. Simelela was saying, because yes, it's multi-layered. There's first how the patient gets into the system, whether they're able to access the system, the technology, the, the, the surgeons, whether they're surgeons, and it gets more complicated, whether you've got gynecologists, oncologists radiation, et cetera. But the first thing is ensuring that the patient who's sick or the patient is able to get screening services. And in our work where we go into the communities doing some health education, health promotion, the biggest problem is the patient doesn't know when to go and look for help or when to go and screen. So I think that's the first place that we need to ensure that we reach the patient that needs to be screened. So how do you do that? Their health promotion and health prevention and that and, and taking the screening services into the community. So I think there are many places where solutions are there. It's just a matter of putting the right things into right policies that are context specific. Thank you very much. While we wait for our next uh, questioner, who will be at the back, I believe. Miriam, you want to respond to that? Sure. I think um, it's really an excellent point around uh, community aware awareness and engagement. And part of that community is actually the medical community. For instance, in sub-Saharan Africa, we know that patients will see on average four to six healthcare providers before definitive diagnosis of their cancer is made. So it's not just educating the communities, but also engaging the medical fraternity um, to see, uh, at least to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms. Then in addition, we've talked about innovation but innovation is not a substitute for dysfunctional health systems. Yeah. What is a system preparedness? We can, yes, increase the awareness in the community. We can uh, increase our diagnostic, but unless we have the uh, backing behind that to actually provide comprehensive treatment in a timely fashion, then our outcomes are not really likely to change. And whereas we're looking at um, external funding for some of these, I think we really need to start to think about how do we hold our policymakers accountable to have deliberate investment in health um, in care of the cancer provision across the continuum, whether it's in research around innovation, whether it's in the actual uh, care delivery, I think it's important for us to be able to really start to have those conversations. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Um, do we have anybody else at the back? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Yuk Ling. I'm from Seoul Network and from Malaysia. Uh, first of all, thank you, Sue. It's really nice to see you here because I'm involved in the, the latest uh, city challenge, uh, uh, city cancer challenge uh, uh, in, in Sue's uh, uh, organization. And we're finding it really, really helpful. I wanted to raise the issue of uh, some speakers alluded to the financial aspect. I think we have also countries where we do have a health system, the infrastructure, but the cost is rather prohibitive uh, for, for cancer treatment. And I think, uh, Teresa, you, you're very aware of that. So, you know, uh, this, is, this is an issue that I think needs to be really addressed. Um, for example, you know, Henrietta likes her cell line, which is so unique. There are more than 10,000 patterns related to her cell lines, which has been developed since. And today in the WHO, sharing of uh, dig digital sequence information it's a very big debate. How do we ensure for equity purposes that when you have sharing, 
of cell line genetic information that the products developed from there will be equitably shared. And I think yep. that really has to be dealt with because we saw from COVID, not partnership from some pharmaceutical companies, but really it was monopoly and a lot of public funding goes to a lot of research as well. So I wanted to raise this. And, you know, Teresa, Roche had a product where the minute the generic entered the market, it went down by 51% the price. You know, so before that, it was really hard to get price reduction. So I think the role of the pharmaceutical industry, the role of intellectual property and good regulation uh, is certainly needed. And lastly, I really want to thank WHO because talking about- I'm going to have to ask you to land. Yeah, the biosafety guidelines. Because I want to answer the question. Was very, very very about helpful. four or five. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Teresa. Sure. So thank you for asking the question about price. I mean, it's obviously always the elephant in the room. And I think when a company like Roche considers the price of its products, we really look at three things. What is the innovation that that drug is bringing to market? Um, is it a best in disease? Is it is it really representing a significant step forward in, in care for patients? Um, what is our ability to provide access around the world to that drug? We do actually... Um, from, from the minute a drug is launched at Roche, we have something called international differential pricing where we look actually at ability to pay and we, we differentially price our drugs around the world. Um, and then we do, frankly, all we, we need to look at the sustainability of our business model going forward. I mean, we are commercial enterprises. Um, and so we do have to look at, are we actually generating enough money with the products that we're putting out into the world that we can fund the innovation and all of the failures that it takes to get to the next Herceptin or to get to the next um, of RISD. And so, you know, I think it's it's always a very delicate balancing act. The the last multiple rounds of products that Roche has, has uh, launched, which have actually in many cases been tested against and beat the standard of care, have launched at prices lower than the standard of care that was in the market. Um, oftentimes when we talk about intellectual property, we just, we have to remember that intellectual property is the foundation of our industry. And if we were to completely remove that, you wouldn't have an innovative pharmaceutical industry anymore. It would, it would essentially disappear. Um, but it's also not generally the thing that keeps drugs from being manufactured. We actually just had an instance with one of our products where we tried to give the IP away and the, 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 the company that we were trying to give it to just said, I can't make any money on it. So I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to manufacture it. So, I mean, I think this, this is a deeply complex issue mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to answer it in a soundbite. It deserves more than a soundbite because I think this is, um, you know, price is one aspect of access, but it's not everything about access. It, it's not the only thing around access. Right. And I think we have to always consider that. No, no, you, you, you want to get involved, you want to intervene? Yeah, I, I want to just respond to two, three things. Um, firstly, on the, the the issue of regulatory frameworks, I think I, I agree that there's work that needs to be done, and WHO is doing that. We're trying to make sure that you know where there isn't capacity for that kind of work, there is a way to build those plat those platforms for countries that don't have regulatory capacity. So there is a lot that um, that needs to be done still, but I think people should just pause for a minute and look at the kinds of things that manifested and happened and actually took place when WHO took the leadership of responding to the, to the pandemic. The platforms for sharing are there. Now, what we are seeing, companies are now not sending uh, uh, information because now the pandemic is over. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if it's possible, for us to do the things we did with COVID, everybody was sharing, all the scientists were coming to the Zooms. We had so in much information, you know, it, vaccines were just being qualified just like that. Yeah. It is possible. And I want to argue that women dying every day, children dying every, every day, wherever they are, is a humanitarian crisis. Yeah. Why is it that we don't look at it that way? Why is it that we don't fast track? Why do that? Why why is there always an argument about there is a problem? The problem is created by us. We are in the same room. Let us resolve it. You know. And yeah. then I want to to speak to one thing really. And here, it's 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 something that I would love people to go home and think about. There is one of the vaccines we are using now to prevent. You know. And this is why I think. Uh, the director general is so passionate about this program is cervical cancer is preventable. Only cancer. If I gave my daughter a vaccine, she wouldn't even know that there was a, you know, so here's that the story. So that's what is driving this. We have a situation where there, there are several HPV vaccines. 
we are told they're expensive. Developing countries can't afford them. A partnership is established whereby through this partnership, developing countries or develop, you know, poor countries are now paying or that the, 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 the partnership has enabled poor countries to get access to that vaccine for $5. Same vaccine being sold in the US for $100. Yeah. Now tell me, if you can manage to do that, what is what is the profit? Very good. What, where Thank is you. The, you know? So let's let's you know. I mean, I'm glad that the discussions around intellectual property are, are going on, but it, it's it, the. I fully something. take your point. I fully take your point. I want to try and get through as many more there, questions as as I can. Yeah. This one is coming because this is being uh, live cast, a webcast, and Dr. Shalini Sarutia, uh, this is for you, uh, Teresa, uh, from, from Roche. Um, can Roche machines with dilutants and testing cartridges be provided in central India through PPP model using uh, using the DNCD marketplace? This will help in initiating HPV DNA testing in India on a large scale. So I'm actually from the pharma business. I don't know, but I have one of my dia colleagues in the audience who might be able to answer that question. Okay. For us. Well, who is that person? Yes. Could we get? Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, pan. Okay. Pan Roche machines, as in the best diagnostic machines, Doctor Sarutia says, with dilutants and testing cartridges, be provided in central India through PPP. Uh, using the DNCD marketplace. This will help in initiating HPV DNA testing in India on a large scale. Okay, there's a lot of acronyms in that question. And yes, those I'm, are, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I cannot help you. you know, we have acronyms. a passion for acronyms, but I'm just going to say, I'm assuming PPP is public-private partnerships yes. in this question. Yes. I am not familiar with the DNC. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Anyone? Anybody? Okay. DNCD. Okay. So I, I'm, so I think, so first of all, I think many people are aware um, of Roche Diagnostics' strong commitment to cervical cancer screening. Um, this is something we're passionate about. This is something we believe in. Um, as was stated, uh, cervical cancer can be prevented. It can be prevented through vaccination, and it can be prevented through screening of women who were unable to get the vaccine when they were younger. Um, in terms of our COBOS systems, where you execute that test, um, our 58, 68, and 8,800, um, those systems, we provide provide our COVID, or sorry, our COBOS reagents for HPV DNA testing. And those systems also have something called an open channel where you can then run other um, reagents on them. So as I said, though, there was a lot of, there was a lot in that question yeah, yeah. that I can't fully decode, um, but, but that's the summary I'm going to give you here. Thank you for answering it. Thank you very much indeed. Right. Um, let me see what we look. Let's get into the middle of the room there. So if you could go to this, about one, two, three people. Or one, two, three, in a row there, okay? Yep, gentlemen there, then gentlemen after you, and then lady in front of you. So one, two, three, okay? The triumvirate will come to you. Please you. Uh, make your question uh, brief now because we don't have a huge amount of time left, yes. My name is Isaac Adewole. I'm a former minister of health from Nigeria. Many of the issues we're talking about today are political issues. Mm -hmm. And I wonder why we're not discussing how to move women into political decision-making positions, because that's the issue. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We'll try, let's get the next question. We're, we're, lots of doctors here, not very many politicians, but thankfully you are one of them. Yes. I'm Michael Hicks. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and I'm also a visiting professor at um, in Lusaka, Zambia. I just wanted to ask, we have early stage cervical cancers, and I wanted to just ask the panel, what would you say is the single most impediment for implementation of having the ability to take care of those type of patients? We know that the surgery is a big need across Sub-Saharan Africa. And I just want to know what would you say is the biggest impediment in that area? Biggest impediment, yes. And then lady there. Hi, my name is Nikki Katar, and I'm a medical student here at Charité, also presenting, uh, representing uh, the Pan-Arabian Society for Gynecological Oncology and HPV Global Action Nonprofit in Canada. I like your point you two made about cervical swabs and doing things content wisely, 
but I don't mean to play the devil's advocate here, but uh, I like the word innovation too. And I'm fully 100% in favor of doing things content wisely, but I'm just wondering where do we actually draw the line between doing things uh, content wisely and actually um, keep underserving people healthcare wisely in the name of these content adaptations? Right. Okay. Thank you very much. We've got three questions there. So, who wants to take the political question first of all? I think Susan. Yes. Okay. <laughs> since you, <laughs> all right. Since you like Paraguay, um, we're going to talk about Paraguay. So, uh, political will is of all the things that makes what we do in cities support things happening. It's the government, right? Governments make decisions, not global health actors, by the way. So. In Paraguay, um, there was a presidential election a few years ago, and we had full support of the government in place, the current government. But it was a clear sense that there was going to be a change in government. So in that case, you have to advocate, you have to get the stakeholders in front of all the political parties. You don't, you don't continue to just talk to one. I think to your point, you bring everyone to the table, you bring the opposition party, you bring the current government together, you bring the private sector partners that are actually working with the current government and the ones that want to work with the new government. And you put them all at a table and you make them talk. Now it's easier said than done, but it's what happened in Paraguay. And after the presidential election where there was a change in government, there was full support from the local stakeholders and the local Ministry of Health to push through a cancer law that had been sitting on the Senate floor for a decade. That cancer law was passed. There's a budget against that cancer law, and that has flowed to a number of different solutions, including decentralization of cancer services, which means that in five regions of Paraguay, you can get local access to treatment and care. Thank you very much. And indeed, you have seven cities in the foundation, but I understand that number is going to increase. It is. In fact, um, I'm very happy to announce that we have two new cities joining City Cancer Challenge, making our network 13 cities now. The two new cities that are joining as of today are Phnom Penh in Cambodia and Rosario in Argentina. And I want to congratulate all of the stakeholders who I know are listening online who are very excited to be part of the network. Tremendous. Thank you very much. It's good to hear. So uh, our professor from Detroit, the single biggest impediment, um, Miriam. Sure, and uh, maybe just um, um, responding as well to Prof Adewale's uh, comment around uh, policy. Yes. And I think uh, there's an opportunity for all of us in the room to think about how do we get ourselves motivated or energized as a global oncology community to speak to policymakers in the language that they understand. If, for instance, we tell them the DNI, or I'm not too <laughs> sure what it was, do they actually understand? And it's really through framing the cancer care delivery as an investment framework, as an economic argument. So it's not just um, this costs X amount, but listen, you're saving this by ensuring that uh, women are diagnosed early and treated in a timely fashion. Um, so I think it's really a call to arms for all of us to really think about how can we in our respective spheres decode the medical speak, because we're guilty of that, mm -hmm. um, and actually translate it into um, sense or things that make sense from an economic perspective. Um, in terms of the um, impediments, Im impediments mm -hmm. I think um, it's a very nuanced argument. We've sort of talked about the big, big three, which is basically the financial, um, the workforce, and the um, social cultural. But I think... Um, um, it really, all of these ultimately, again, circle back to funding. And so it still comes down to policy. How do we really push um, as a global oncology community around advocacy, whether it's from the surgical front, whether it's from the diagnostics, whether it's from uh, quality of life and supportive aftercare. It's really thinking about how do we um, develop a strategic advocacy, so to speak, that will actually ultimately result in more funding being available for cancer care across the continuum. Excellent. We've got only seven minutes left. So I'm going to, have to ask everybody, including the panelists, to be as brief as possible in their replies so we can get at least a few more. Um, no, no. I know you want to come in at this point. Yes, no, <laughs> I wanted to offer um, a challenge on the Paraguay thing that uh, 
we will be right behind them. Every city that gets onto your list, we'll make sure that we've got the diagnostics there because we've just started now in Paraguay and I can see my colleagues from there. We are chasing uh, the cervical cancer there. Thank you. It, Very it, good, okay, it, excellent. Jeremy, the question from my world class students I had a question. Yes. Um, it was sort of, um, hmm, I'm trying to sum it up. It's a, it's a philosophical question. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Uh, and I and it will require a longer answer than you've got time for, so be brief. Yes. Uh, I think that a panel with a Singaporean wouldn't be complete with without a quote from, from really Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And he used to tell us that he sees the world as it is, not how he would like it to be. And I fear that in these meetings, we can be idealistic, but we need to be grounded in yeah. really pragmatism. Let's grab the chances that we can, and let's be clear about who does what. I would love for Mr. Lee Kuan Yew to be my lawyer, <laughs> but I certainly don't want him to be my doctor. No. Right? <laughs> so in the same way, let's leave the politics to the politicians, but let's be useful influencers of these political this, uh, um really discussions. And I do remember that one of my mentors told me the most important job of the minister is to get re-elected. Yes, so how is. do we help the minister to get re-elected and our own global health agenda can then be fulfilled also? Yeah. Thank you very much. Let me take another question. I want to take it from a part of the room that hasn't asked one yet. No, no, no. No, we've asked questions from there, but over there maybe. Uh, gentleman there, and then we'll take another one there. Please make it as tight as possible. Yeah. Thank question. you. First, I want to say this is one of the most invigorating conversations I have heard in years. And I don't go to meetings like this anymore. And that's why. <laughs> well, not when you're missing sometimes. So. I, I love the disruptive thought process. And that's, that's, what it, that's what it's going to take. Jeremy, I want to know where you think the microbiome <laughs> is important in terms of cancer prevention or treatment, particularly as it relates to cervical cancer and maybe even breast. Jeremy. Okay, there wouldn't be time for a full answer. Let me just say <laughs> that the microbiome is very, very tied to immune to, to immunology, and it probably represents a very important pathway to modify the immune system and hence optimize the response to vaccines, to really cancer therapies. Mm -hmm. Stop. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Yes. Oh, hi, my name is Yifan. I'm a representative from International Pharmaceutical Students Federation. I think all of the initiative sounds great. I was wondering, in your region, uh, what's the level of involvement of youth healthcare workers or trainees uh, in these initiatives? And uh, if not, what more role do you see in them? Thank you. Thank you very much. Who wants to answer that? Looking at all of you. I'm going to go to, no, no. No, Jeremy wants to. Okay, just a, okay, Jeremy, uh, just a very quick, I was asked to speak to some medical students about global health, and this was during the really pandemic. I thought I'd be speaking to five of them. Across three medical schools in Singapore, there were almost 200 students. So I'm so impressed and encouraged by the young. I think you will save us, the old people, from ourselves. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And you've got a couple of questions here. I'm not sure if we're going to have time to answer this from Gilbert Schoenfelder. This, he, he wants this to be targeted at you, Teresa. Uh, could you comment a little bit more on the statement about sex bias in basic research on animals and the consequences for humans? Do you have a 30 second response to that? I think that's much larger than a 30 yes. second response. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> um, but I think the reality is when you're focused on a gender that actually doesn't have the biologic um this isn't biologically representative. You're just not going to get the right foundation to start from. Okay. And Larissa Machado talks about, she's at the University of Sao Paulo Dentistry School. Uh, orofangio, HPV plus cancer, also preventable by vaccination. So by promoting worldwide HPV vaccination of young populations, we'd be preventing at least two types of cancer for females and one for males. It'd be interesting for diminishing the financial burden of public health systems with the expense of cancer treatment. I think we all agree on that. I'm going to ask you all now for your final closing thoughts, parting question for all of you. I want you to respond within 30 seconds, please. Um, so come in on time and on budget. If there was one thing the global cancer community could prioritize next year, so in 2023, to improve women's cancer care, what would that be? So one thing to prioritize in 2023. Who wants to start? No, no. 
me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, great. I have two things, you know. I, I think that's 15 seconds each. Um, <laughs> all right, to 15. I think the only way you bring change is from within. You know, you can only change if you are willing to look inside yourself and reflect on what is it you bring to the table. So for the people here and those listening, I would love for you to go back to basics, you know, change spaces. If you were the women or whoever is out there that doesn't have, what would you feel? And how would that five minute time you spend in those spaces change how you do your work, how you interact with your patients and how you, you collaborate? across disciplines okay. that would be the most important thing thank you very and much and then it means next year we don't have a cancer community we have a community that is concerned about human survival yes All right theresa uh, i'm going to echo the education and just underscore we need to tell people what they need to know what not what we want them to hear hmm. thank you very much susan uh, disaggregated data. So we spent a good chunk of time talking about women and, and contextualization, but we can't do that if we don't have data that includes women. Thank you very much. Jeremy. Implementation is policy. We know what we have to do. Talk less, do more. Fantastic. Miriam? I think uh, mine is collaboration. Let's get all the players in the room, whether it's the educators, the researchers, and to, again, really flog the Homer analogy, all hands on deck are needed. Thank you. They've been a wonderful panel. Put your hands together for Dr. Miriam Mutebi, Dr. Jeremy Fungian Lim, Dr. Susan Henschel, Theresa Graham, and Princess Nono Simonela. Thank you very much indeed. Let's hope we really are on the verge of a new era of control for women's cancer thank you very much as well you've been a wonderful and engaged audience thank you very much to everybody watching online too thank you